Bobby. So uh, I'm actually not going to talk about event sourcing. Sorry for that. I'm going to talk about events, but event sourcing. Well, maybe I'm going to mention it. Well, I mentioned it now. But uh, the talk is really not about event sourcing. Um, it's about events, though. Ha uh ha. -huh. I just like this motif. It's not related to the talk at all. So let's skip this one. Why should you even listen to me? Well, I've done software development for a long time. Right? I've built asynchronous systems for 20 years or so. And um, so I thought I'd put this up. Uh, to make me seem more, you know, knowledgeable. And when I when I wrote this, I kind of reflected on my also my speaker career. And I think the first talk I gave about events was ten years ago in Amsterdam, and that was super complicated stuff. It was, uh, you know, about multiple systems integrating multiple. Systems. It was really about migrating from enterprise systems using distributed tra transactions and so to event-driven sort of reactive systems. Super complicated stuff. Now, ten years later. I talk about super simple stuff, like what is an event? I can talk now for 40 minutes about events. So, yeah, I don't, so I don't really know what it tells us. I guess when I was younger, or, well, <laughs> a bit younger, um, I talked about stuff to show that I know about this, right? I wanted to talk about the complicated stuff so everybody could see, hey, I know this complicated stuff, I can talk about it. And now, 10 years later, I have a different idea of what's really important. So now I talk about the really important stuff, the really fundamental stuff. So good for you that you haven't been to my talk 10 years ago, but uh, <laughs> a different one now. Uh, because we're going to talk about really basic fundamental stuff, events, like very fundamental unit of, of communication. Event is also kind of overloaded term, right? It can be, oops, um, in IoT, we have loads of events from sensors. We have uh, UI events. Maybe you think of uh, what other events are there. there are a lot of systems, uh, a lot of ways. Oh, event sourcing. We have event sourcing events. So different kinds of events. Uh, a lot of things that, that work with events. I talk about business systems, right? Basically, your your you know vanilla web store or your bank or your or you can book something. Maybe you have some sort of business transaction. You probably have some client. Maybe some web browser. You you expose a REST interface or whatever. Uh, they make requests to you. You do something. You store some data. Simple stuff. Uh, nowadays, when we build these services, it's probably not just, not just going to be. <coughs> sorry, I'm a bit there. <coughs> nowadays, when we build these services, it's probably not just going to be one uh, one deployment, right? There's one service. We're probably building a system of multiple services, microservices, if you will, right? So. Here, you, you get some client requests, you do something, you store something, but you also talk to other services. This is like a totally random example, not totally random. This is an example, just working with inventory and orders and payments, taken from like other talks that talk about um, these systems. Um, just to, to have this kind of hello world style, uh, simplest system. So these other services, they might do other things, uh, and you communicate with them. And this is what I want to talk about today. We need only like a tiny, a tiny fraction of this complexity. I just want to talk about communication between services. Not about how we store the data, not how about we distribute the data, not about how we communicate with front ends or users, just inter-service communication, right? So just this horizontal layer here. So let's take a very, let's start with a very basic example. As I said, like hello world style for a say, distributed process. Uh, we have an order process, and the, so the simple idea for this flow is uh, you get an order in, and this whole flow should succeed if the inventory is, uh, if there is stock, right, if you have the item and you can ship it, and it's been paid for. So if either of these uh, does not work, you want the process to fail. If these both succeed, you want the process to succeed, right? Um, so a request comes in for the order service, and here we just use outgoing HTTP, gRPC calls, what have you, right? So we make a call to the inventory service, it will respond and say, yes, uh, it's there. Well, we get the payment, we ship the item. Now, obviously, well, obviously, here are some dependencies here, right? This is probably not what we want to build because we have this one-time dependency between the services, right? We have these synchronous outgoing calls. So if one, well, this obviously would go on as well, right? You will have other services, <coughs> other services that call other services that call other services. So if one of these services in the call chain is slow, it will slow down your whole system, right? You have these one-time, if there's one-time dependency, or some people say a temporal dependency, all of these services have to be up and, and available at the same time. Um, oh, talking about availability, right? If, if you're sort of the service that gets the requests from the outside, 
has certain um, availability requirements, say uh, four nines, then all of the services it depends on, when depending on the number of services it depends on, but you can easily calculate that these need to be much more available, right? So you easily get into a situation where, you, where it's difficult to, to guarantee certain response times or to guarantee a high availability. So what do we do? We move away from these synchronous calls, right? We use asynchronous communication. So instead of just making a DFPC call, I send a message. I'm using some sort of message bus. Right? Um, so instead of calling the inventory service, I send an inventory reservation message. Um, I get a confirmation message back. I send a So how is this better? Yeah, it isn't, right? This is not better at all. It's still, I mean, I still totally depend on the other services. At runtime, I still have this temporal, um, this temporal uh, dependency. Right, because my flow requires the responses of the other services. Well, it's, just, it's basically the same request-response pattern. I'm asking the service for a response, and my process continues when I get this response. So I just made it more complicated, really, because now I have to deal with my messaging infrastructure, and I have to deal with timeouts, and I have to deal with uh, maybe, well, what are, whatever errors can occur there. So... This is a, yeah, this message-driven communication in this case with the same flow, I don't think it really helps. So, as I said, we want to talk about fundamentals. Let's talk about events. So when we talk about, I said we talk about communication between services, right? When we talk about this, we usually distinguish the kinds of communication in these three categories, queries, commands, and events, right? A query is like a get request, right? I say, give me some information. Give me a list of users. Give me your inventory. Um, yeah, not something we're interested in right now. As someone once said, queries are for front ends. We, we don't deal with front ends right now, we deal with inter service communication. Commands, an expression of intent, right? I want someone, or in this case, something, a service to do something. Reserve this inventory, or print this document, or send this notification, right? So I tell something, someone to do something, um, as opposed to an event. An event expresses a fact. Something has happened, right? Maybe an order has been placed, or a, uh, uh, a, a certain value has been measured. Uh, it's 20 degrees out, or oh, it's 16 degrees outside, right? It's a fact that we can um, transport as an event. It doesn't tell me to do a certain thing, but I can take note of this and, and maybe react on this. Are you with me? Well, everybody's looking for a puzzle, like, what is he going on about? Okay. Um, so hey, let's uh, maybe this is better, right? Because event-driven architecture is great. It's all about decoupling. Um, let's move it to events. And now, instead of telling the inventory service, uh, please uh, reserve this item, I just sort of um, emit some information. I just say the order has been submitted. And maybe at this point, at runtime. I don't really care about who picks up this event, right? So, in, of course, when we design the system, we know. But here, I'm kind of freed of this, and I just submit, uh, I just uh, post this event, and uh, and then at some point later in time, I pick up another event, and I say, oh, an item has been reserved, I can go on. Now, if you've paid uh, attention, you see this looks exactly like the one before, right? Yeah? Exactly. Except you have two inventories that listen, and you have two items. I didn't, I don't... If just the order submitted and you have two services who pick up that event and reserve items, then you might be... Oh yeah, maybe that's something you want. Yeah, you could have this, uh, definitely, yeah. Uh, also, but <laughs> that's actually a good point. You could add multiple services that also, so you would actually gain something from this, right? Instead of talking to one service directly, you emit this event and multiple services can listen to this. This is not the case here though, right? These events have one certain, they're basically addressed to one other service, right? So, as I said, when you paid attention, and, oh, well, you don't, don't even have to have paid a lot of attention, but you can probably see that this looks exactly like the one before. We just renamed our messages here. Instead of saying reserve inventory, we say order submitted. What's the point? Why, why do we do this? Technically, these are events. <coughs> these convey a fact. But these are events that we address, or when we are super certain of one, one recipient that will pick this up. And we actually, after we submitted this, or after we emitted this event, 
we're actually waiting for a response. We're just not calling it this, we're just saying, oh yeah, now I'm just going to listen to events. Oh, right, here's an item reserved event, great, so now I can go on. So you would think, who would build a system like this? But you would be surprised, people actually do this. In fact, it's so common that Martin Fowler um, created a term for these kinds of events. And he says, these are passive-aggressive commands. <laughs> right? It feels like saying, uh, right? Like, I don't call you and say, hey, can you pick me up, please? I sometimes send you a message and say, hey, I've been standing here for 10 minutes. That's an event, right? <laughs> or, well, maybe an hour. So that's an event, but what I really say is, hey, where the fuck are you? Pick me up. Well, that's another command, right? What I really say is, pick me up. So this is also not what we want to build, uh, not what we want to build. So now I, I wonder if... Just making things events doesn't really help that much. Maybe event-driven architecture isn't so much about events after all. What is it about? Maybe it's more about flow, about processes and, and workflows. So in a, in a workflow, as we saw here, the, the one I showed so far, we have this request response pattern all through, right? I send a request, I wait for a response. And it's like very much like uh, method calls and imperative programming, right? I call something, um, it could be local, I could have this uh, reserve inventory method locally and say we reserve the inventory and then I get some confirmation back or I get some error, some exception, right? And then if this step is okay, I go on to the next step, I go on to the next step, but it all goes back to the central flow. And this kind of makes it, yeah, it's, 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 it's uh, centers around here, we're going to look at the drawbacks of this a bit later. Um, and I think where we want to go, or where I want to go with my systems, is much more a flow-like architecture, right? I don't want this call out, call forth and back, and have this kind of central coordinator. I want the events to flow through the systems, and I want each of these services to have kind of their own responsibility and take care of, kind of their stuff. So maybe we have to look at other properties as well of our events and commands, not only on the sort of semantics, what do we express here, and how do we, I didn't even mention the naming, right? Also, obviously, uh, commands are usually imperative, right? Do something, when we express facts, um, then uh, it's usually, what is it, uh, you know, the past, right? It's something happened, something was updated, or something was whatever. So obviously just the naming doesn't change it. So we talked about kind of the semantics of these messages. Let's talk about the associated, let's say, communication patterns, or, well, as I wrote, in this case, expected responses. For a command, I expect, usually I expect some confirmation or information that it failed, right? If I make an HTTP call that says, put this data here, I get some, uh, what do I get back? I don't know, 202 or four or something. <laughs> some um, success code, or I get a whatever, 500 something fail, right? Yeah. Whenever I place a command, a command can fail. If I tell you to do something, maybe you're not in a position to do something. If I say, uh, get this money from this account, maybe the money isn't there. So I need to know if it worked or not, because I need to react on this somehow. Um, for events, well, how can an event fail, right? If the information is 20 degrees, then that's it, that's the fact. If I, maybe, well, we, we're gonna talk about later and what happens if I can't handle the fact, but the fact remains. Maybe I have a system that can only handle temperatures up to 30 degrees, and now, um, after global warming, I get a new event that says, oh, it's 32 degrees, it's still a fact, right? I cannot say, oh no, I, I reject this fact. It can't be 32 degrees. This was measured, it, it's a fact, so this can't fail. Would be uh, command and intent the right pair? Yeah. Is it a pair in the sense of... Like, I mean, event doesn't say anything, but the command and... Uh, command it in, expresses intent, yeah. yeah okay. That's what I meant here with expresses an intention, right? It's an intent. Um, in terms of communication, the pattern should always be request-response for commands, right? I send something, get a response. This can be synchronous with an HTTP call or a DRPC call. It can be asynchronous, but it will still be, I send a message where some correlation idea gets a message back that I can relate to the initial message I sent. For events, I don't care about the response, right? I, I, I publish this event. I submit, I emit the event. At this point, at runtime, I don't even know who's going to pick it up. 
maybe there are five services. Somebody said this. Right? There might be five services uh, picking up this event. How, like, how do I say how many? I don't even know how many responses I should expect. And what, why would I even care about the response? I said it's 20 degrees. If thanks for noticing it, or <laughs> thanks for acknowledging that you heard, heard this, but it's not going to, you know, I, I didn't do anything with this. Okay, so when I try to build systems like this with people, I see there are certain stumbling blocks. There are certain things that people really have, have trouble with. Um, and maybe I should say this as well. When we talk about this, there are, there are also external stumbling blocks where you might have to integrate some third-party system that is not event-driven. And you might have, there are a lot of, there's a lot of dirty real-world stuff where we have to extend this model. Here I'm only talking about the services that we build, about the system that we design that we have under our control. Um, which is still something, right? This is how we make our living. So, and we talk about, as I said, we talk about business processes. So you want some, you know, you want to rely on these. You want, if you get this order in, and uh, you, want to, you want to make sure you actually get the money for the product, you want to make sure the product is sent, and so on. It's not like, uh, you know, uh, it's not like nobody cares. Oh, I just fire and forget this event, and let's see what happens. So, but this is what people struggle with, right? We say, oh, we just emit the event, and then we're done. People say, hey, wait, no, you're not done, right? You're sort of, what about the end-to-end -end process? Like, we're not, our responsibility is not only to, to uh, emit an event that the order has been uh, received. Our responsibility is that the, the customer gets the product. So there's something around this fire and forget uh, that we need for it to work, and that is promises. Well, there are different ways of phrasing this, but... As it happens, there's a book called Thinking and Promises about promise theory, and I thought there's a nice connection. And of course, he also talks about systems and, and guarantees of what systems promise. Well, basically, also I should know, I'm not, this is not a complete endorsement of the book. I don't think it's a great book. Um, it's terrible. <laughs> somebody says it's terrible? What? <laughs> yeah. It's a terrible book. It's a terrible book, but I think there is some, the intuition behind promise theory, I think is good. Well, what the book does is sort of, make philosophical statements like these, like A makes a promise to A2 uh, that, it's, that it will receive B, or it could also make a promise to emit something and it's a plus instead of a minus. And then it, it, it creates some notation around this. But as I said, it's not a great book, but you could say our payment service makes a promise to the order service that the order is created. So maybe let's go more to the sort of intuition part of this. We don't think of services as something that we instruct. I don't tell the service what to do. I don't tell the service reserve this item or maybe multiple steps. So the initial, the opener of the book is, uh, I think it's about hiring somebody to clean up your place. When you have a place that needs to be cleaned uh, and you have different ways of handling this. You can go uh, take this so cleaning person and say, so here, pick up the brush and then you do this. You wipe this area out and then you do this. Uh, this is not promise-based, right? See, in the promise world of things, you would say this is an autonomous agent that has some idea of how to clean a place. And you say, hey, I need you. I, need, I have a certain expectation. I need this place to be cleaned. And this is the promise that this um, cleaning service makes. Right? So I rely on this promise. I don't care about the details. Um, so we think of our systems as autonomous agents that are not controlled from without, that, that have their own processes within. And promises arise when we share our... Okay, here it says intentions, also not so great, but... This is just a Wikipedia page. Maybe I can edit this. Um, <laughs> so I, I emit an event and somebody will pick it up. And I rely on this because there is a promise. And this is very important, right? We don't, we often talk about the decoupling in event-driven systems, that we emit an event and at one time I don't even, I don't have to care who picks it up. I just publish the event and I'm done. But at, at design time, when we design our systems, when we build our systems, we do care who picks it up. Right? We don't design our systems in a way that we say, hey, we emit an event, and then let's see what happens. Hey. No, we design it in a way that somebody gives a promise. If an order is placed, I promise I will pick up this event. And we can, you can think this further. You can say also our infrastructure has to make certain promises. Right? If I publish this on a topic, uh, the promise is that this will be delivered at least once, say. Or well, if we talk public subscribe, delivered, it will be persisted for a given time, for the retention time, and, and people can pick it up. <coughs> and I can make a promise how long it's going to take me to do something, right? I can promise to, to um, have certain throughput of events. 
doubling down on the intuition bit, when we talk about synchronous versus asynchronous, asynchronous um, communication, then an intuitive approach to this would be to talk about uh, communication with other people. So if I call somebody, that will be synchronous, right? The person has to be there at the same time, and I'm blocked while I talk to this person, right? So this is very much a synchronous call, right? If I want to, to do it asynchronously, I can just send a message, right? So I don't, I'm not blocked waiting for the response. Uh, I just send a message and wait for some response. So what is events? Event is I send a message through a WhatsApp group saying, hey, I'm here, and then I hope Maybe somebody reads it and, and reacts on it. That would be bad, right? Because there were no promises made, right? I just no. Uh, unfortunately, I don't. I haven't found a good metaphor um, in the telephone space for this. But I think what's a good metaphor or a good image for uh, events is this. This is a kitchen information system, or in this case, a very mechanical one, a tap bar. So you go to a restaurant, you order pizza, the waiter takes your order. And then the waiter puts the tap on this bar. This is an event, right? The waiter, this is the information, this is the fact. Pizza margarita ordered, table 15 or whatever. And it just, the waiter just emits the event and goes back doing their business. But he knows, or she knows, somebody's going to pick up the tap. Right? This is the promise the kitchen makes. The kitchen makes, uh, the kitchen says, whenever you put something here, don't worry, we're going to pick it up, we're going to make the pizza. And then when the pizza is done, we're going to put it somewhere, we're going to ring a bell. Somebody else could come pick it up and, and deliver the pizza. Usually it's going to be the same waiter, right? But um, here, this is, there are promises in play here, right? So the waiter, of course, they, they, people have different roles. And the waiter is not, this is not a transactional process. Also in terms of asking for inventory, right? Assumptions are being made. <laughs> so the waiter will not go to the kitchen. But if I order the pizza margarita, the waiter's not going to go to the kitchen and say, hey, can you make a pizza margarita? And the, the kitchen says yes, and he comes back and says, oh, you're lucky, we can make a pizza margarita. He would just assume they can make a pizza margarita because that's their promise. If they can't do it, it's their problem, uh, they, they will find tomatoes somewhere. So, yeah, um, the whole event thing works because we make promises. I think that's the point, right? There are assumptions in terms of people say they are going to do something when we emit these events. Lots of time. Very similar aspect. Basically, same thing, slightly different uh, angle on this. I said events can't fail, right? 20 degrees, blah, blah, blah. but I also uh, already hinted at this. That's, of course, a kind of naive look at it. If I say I have this payment service and I say, uh, get, the, give me the money, and the money isn't there, uh, this operation fails. Now, I don't do this, I don't send this command, I send an event. The order has been placed, and the payment service knows uh, I need 20 euros now. But there's no money there, so it's the, the, this doesn't solve the problem if there's no money. Just because it's an event now, it doesn't magically appear, uh, it still fails, in a way. Right? The event doesn't fail, the fact is still there. So what happens here? Let's say it's a command-based system. Um, I get the request in, and uh, whatever, give me the money, and handing the incoming request is actually quite easy. Um, because if, it, if I can't fulfill it, I just uh, react with an error, right? Hey, do this, no I can't, or error 500, whatever. Right? This is easy for me, I don't have to deal with much here. On the other side, if I am the caller, now I have all sorts of problems, right? I call some other service and say, give me the money, and I just get the error message back, or I don't get anything back, or it times out. Uh, now, I have all the problems, now I have to react. I'm probably not the, the right person or the right service to react on this, because it's in the payments domain, right? When, when they say, okay, uh, we had a problem getting this payment, okay, what am I going to do? Thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, so, with events, we still, the overall work, I would say, is still the same, but we shift this around. Right? Now, if I publish an event, that's easy. That's a fact. Uh, all the place. I'm done. Please, somebody pick it up. I don't care. But uh, now I have to work when I get this event, because now it's my responsibility to do something. Right? So now, as soon as I acknowledge the event, then uh, I express that I've taken care of it. Right? Let's say, uh, in our kitchen example, if I get the event, he wants a pizza capricciosa, and... Uh, um, 
Uh, maybe the example is not so great. But, but theoretically, like I'm missing a, an ingredient, then now it would be my problem and I have to send somebody else uh, out to get some more mushrooms or whatever so I can make the pizza. So I have to handle the whole thing. I cannot just say, oh, sorry, no, no pizza today. Of course, well, this is why the example is bad, because I could say this. But um, <laughs> <coughs> the point is, of course, we have to handle the errors. The, the big difference is where do we handle the error? Why does the caller always have to be responsible to, to take care of the errors? And this is actually, uh, I think, one of the biggest gains we get from using events, that we have this clear separation and say, hey, this is your domain, and also if anything goes wrong in this domain, it's your problem. Okay, I can, we're good on time, I think. I can speak a bit slower. Yeah, like, um, uh, 30 minutes. <laughs> ah, very good. Only 40 slides to go. Um, no, I have some extra slides, and, and we can uh, skip them. Yes? Yeah, if you go back to that one, if, if you look at that for the payment model, so if whatever, you have a credit card and the payment fails and so on, it's hard to assume that the payment service now go, goes out after the client to get the money. Because ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's, let's keep, keep the thought. Let's... let's uh, talk about this a bit later, how we handle errors uh, then really, or maybe maybe the next couple of slides uh, even help with this. You're all functional programmers, right? I think, or I've heard a lot of people here are functional programmers, so this is going to be first of all, I apologize for the bad code you're going to see, uh, and also, it doesn't really have to do anything the functional programming. It's, we're talking about mental models here. Um, these things are, are, are difficult to teach, they're difficult to advocate. If I try to get people who are used to writing imperative code and who are used to doing HTTP calls to do everything. If I try to work uh, with these people to build event-driven distributed systems, this is hard. It's hard, they have to let go of a lot of things, and it's a f they feel they lose control and they don't understand it. So we work with mental models, right? We, we, we try to talk about promises, right? And say, hey, you know, you can emit the event, and then you don't have to sort of, well, I've worked with people who emitted events, and then sort of build an extra infrastructure to sort of track if the other service has actually processed the event and, uh, and uh, so they could send the event again or whatever, right? Because they didn't trust in the promises of others or they didn't understand the concept of promises. And with the errors, it might be similar, right? So what's, uh, and thinking about some aspects of functional programming might be a good model to think about this. If I have a partial function, Right? Uh, this can result in an error. I think functional programmers don't like partial functions, right? because it messes up your stuff. Uh, you have this, you map and flat map stuff, but then um, it can't handle this value because it's not a total function, and it gets in Scala, it's, I think it's a match error. Right? You get this kind of exception. Um, and this is what we have in, in a command-based system. You get a command in, maybe you can handle it, and you produce a result, maybe... Uh, it's outside of your value range, say, and so you produce an error problem back to the caller. In, in proper functional programming, I think, or <laughs> um, you want to work, oh no, I know, it is a partial function in Scala, it's called lifted. You can, well, there's different types of lifting, I think, and, and depending on your language and uh, what type classes you use, but in this case, in Scala, you can use a partial function and lift it to a total function. And what this does, it, it converts the result type from the sort of, uh, from the uh, simple value to a, to a sum type, right? You can have uh, some, it wraps it in an option, basically, right? You can have some result or you can have none. Both totally valid results, um, option none or option some result. And now it, it's total. Now you get the event in and you split the flow, right? Rather than going back to, um, uh, to the caller, or the event submitter, which, which you never would, you say, okay, we're on the happy path, I have some results, so we can go on, somebody else can pick up the result and do something with it, or now we're on the, uh, on the sort of error path, and now the order basically has to go, has to backtrack, or well, let's, now we get into the, so how do we, do we design the process and what we actually have to do. But this is, I think, the, this kind of request response workflow, it's like really terrible imperative code, right? Like a reserve item, did it get an error? Oh yeah, I have to throw an error. Or no, it worked, so I'm gonna do the next step. I do this, and all of the sort of <coughs> comes, is kind of convoluted in this kind of central outgoing cause. Uh, while what's much nicer is this kind of railway-based programming, right? Where you sort of, oh yeah, I get this value, and maybe it's valid, maybe it's a non, but then I can flat map on this, I can flat map on this, and if it's 
if it's an error, okay, then the whole railway sort of gets on this other track, and now I'm on the kind of error path, but I, I can still model my flow in this way. And I think this is something, well, if I would build event-driven systems with functional programmers, I would try to, uh, you know, emphasize this and say, hey, when you build distributed systems, try to stay in the same mindset. Try to do this kind of, you just want to flat map your stuff. Huh, very good. So, so far, uh, I've tricked you a bit, right? I haven't really talked about the unreasonable effectiveness of events. I have talked about some effects of events, right? So, if you think of event-driven architecture and events, you have to go beyond thinking just about the event and the sort of semantics of the event and its effect, which it is, which is good. But you also have to think about flow. And you have to think about what this enables. The, the, fact, the fact that you now emit facts rather than issuing commands enables this kind of flow and enables uh, the services that process this to be you know, similar to, to total functions, to be kind of self-contained or they give a promise, they kind of handle any, anything that comes their way themselves. I would go so far as to say that it's an event at this point isn't really that important. You could actually imagine a command. It, if you have the same secondary properties, right? If you say, this is how I handle commands. I have a command, send notification. But the service that picks it up, the notification service, uh, gives the promise that it will deal with this somehow. It will send the notification, or if there's an error, well, it will raise the error in whatever monitoring system this service has, or it will, I don't know what it's going to do. It's going to create some log message or whatever, right? But it, it, for me, I, I, don't, I don't care. I emitted the notification command. Uh, the other service will take care of it. So I'm also not respecting the response. I'm not saying you should do this. I just want to make the point it's more about the flow and the guarantees and promises the other services make than about the wording of, of your message. But it's actually nicer if you use events, right? Because of these, uh, it, it builds on the idea of, you know, other services can pick it up and, and you, you emit effect and so on. But there might be edge cases. I think notification is actually something where we could discuss it, that would actually make sense. So I'm not saying you should do this. Again, just like a mind experiment, um, think more about the expected response and the communication pattern than uh, the phrasing of your events. <coughs> yeah, and this is kind of my, my, the point I already made, right? Um, and talking further about how to advocate this, how to teach this, the term event can be misleading to some, right? People think of event sourcing. There are also uh, different types of events and event collaboration, like event notifications, where you just say something has changed, but you don't really convey any information other than some ID or so. The people might get confused about, are you talking about event sourcing? Are you talking about IoT events? Are you talking about big data event streaming stuff? You, so when we want to talk about how we design our flows and systems, maybe it makes sense to introduce another layer, right? And say, oh, we also want to break up our workflows. Uh, we want to introduce micro workflows. And this is especially important when you work with people who move from a monolithic world uh, to microservices, right? Because sometimes they have these workflows in a monolith, they want to move to microservices, and then they just want to take the same workflow <coughs> over and, and expect that everything to work. Um, I strongly believe that when we move from monoliths to microservices, we also need to move from workflows to micro workflows. In, in this case, a micro workflow where is not very well defined, right? Anything can happen in this. But the idea is it's triggered by an event, and it ends with events, right? And then it can do something in between, but uh, it doesn't orchestrate multiple services, right? It, it will never use commands, or will, there will never be commands to orchestrate micro-workflows. That's the idea there. So maybe at least a little bit about then the, the positive outcomes of this. I don't even have a slide about scalability and resilience because I think that's covered in so many talks. Right? If you look at any event-driven talk, you're going to talk mostly about this, how it scales so nicely because um, well, you don't have this temporal dependency anymore. Right? Rather than services breaking your system, maybe you build up some, some lag, some consumer lag in your messaging system, but then you can just scale up the other services and they can pick it up. And, uh, and because the... Well, I'm going to... Uh, now I would have needed another slide. But the goal, when you remember one of the first slides where we had this sort of 
uh, the services talking to each other, and the vertical slice was the client, the service, and the data store. Right? The goal that we have is that we can answer any request without reaching out to the other services, right? so that at runtime, we don't care. We don't have any runtime dependencies on the others. Right? So um, and this is the resilience we get in a proper event-driven system. And why? We will going to see later. Uh, what people, I think, undervalue and underestimate is uh, testing, for example. If you, have, if you want to test throughput of a service and it's a, a real event-driven service, it's rather easy. Of course, it's, it's still work and it's still an integration test. You might still have your database, other stuff. But it's relatively easy to test it in isolation. Right? You, can, you can measure the throughput of your service. And, and then you, and these actually sort of compose. Right? And if the throughput of all your services is whatever, then that, that will work. With outgoing calls, and there's a lot, a lot more mocking and, and simulation going on if you have uh, request response patterns also for testing. And what I really like about this is that you have this clear separation of domains, both in design but also in, in operations, basically, or in running the services. In any request response based systems, if you have an error, there's usually going to be two parties involved. Right? So let's say I call the payment service and I get the error back. Now, uh, I'm probably the one who gets the alert, and what I see is, okay, there's an error in the payment system, and now I'm going to say, hey, payment system, it's your problem. Payment system is going to say, no, this is an error that can happen. You have to handle this, right? So there's always this, um, this split of business logic. I will always have some business logic in my workflow engine, in my orchestrator, or in my sort of central component that, that uh, controls the workflow, which has to deal with the services and errors. Um, so for everything that happens, I have to start to dig deeper and say, is it an error that shouldn't have happened, so it's really the whatever payment services problem, or is it an error that I should have expected and it's my problem? And with events, I think this is much easier, right? There's, I don't even have a slide for that because it's too easy. Obviously, if I get the event, I'm responsible, right? So I have to deal with the error. There's no other service um, I can call and say, hey, it's your problem. For this to work, and this kind of wraps it up, there's four slides to go. Um, a super important principle that people need to understand is we separate control and observability. Right? People will say, I need end-to-end -end visibility. If you just emit events and there's some other service picking up the event, how can I see where I am in the process? How can I detect if there's whatever? Right? Um, I'm not going to go and dig into every service and see, oh, where is the event currently being processed? So you want to have some sort of visibility outside of, of, um, the, sort of the control flow. Um, and also super important, the data travels to the process, right? So um, I'm, in this case, okay, inventory updates, just think of the, um, what was it, the waiter again, right? He has the menu. This is the, the stock. This is the inventory. Now, if we run out of inventory, I need to send a message to the waiter so we erase this uh, from the menu, right? So, of course, there's eventual consistency, right? Maybe um, there's some, uh, some race condition and... Maybe there is some exception in the trade. We can uh, um, some exception. We can uh, talk about this later. But the general idea is uh, in any event of the system, and this this enables what I said earlier, right? The order service should be able to handle the order. Well, it wouldn't even work without this because we could just accept orders in other scenarios. But of course, the waiter needs to be able to take orders from people without reaching out to anyone else, right? So the waiter has to have the data if there are any any dishes no longer available. So summarizing. Okay, oh, I have some bonus content. You can uh, look this up online. Um, mm -hmm. Event driven architecture enables scalability, resilience, and, which I think is under, undervalued, it really emphasizes the domain boundaries. It really emphasizes responsibility boundaries, right? If I pick up the event, I'm responsible, not the one who called me. Why should the caller also be the one who cares about the errors? And lastly, if you think uh, an event, if you want to build event driven architectures, Think in events, that's great. Think in facts, but you have to think beyond this as well. Don't take your sort of imperative approach, don't take your request response approach, and just rename the things to be uh, facts, uh, because then you're kind of fooling yourself. Right? You really have to look into the flow as well and have a nice um, yeah, event-driven stream. And that was it for today. Thanks for your uh, patience. Thank you. Are there any questions? 
question. Maybe not a question, but uh, let's be talking about that. And you suddenly you said something like you're suddenly not going to like what I what I would exactly. <laughs> It's exactly the opposite is the case. So it's, it was really great in the differentiation also on the semantics that I came to say this already. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Exactly the way to go. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a question on the technical side. So you say the service is fully responsible for an event. Yeah. What if I don't understand the event? I have input validation, I'm very yeah. I have my, my correct API, whatever. And I say, okay. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a real exception, right? So you want to enforce some, or well, things to handle this is, first you want to enforce some governance on your topics, say, right? You want to make sure they, they, um, that they adhere to a certain schema, to a certain format. So if you suddenly get a total different type of event on your, on your topic, something is really messed up. So it's fine if this, is, if this is handled, this might need some manual intervention, let's say. About the responsibility, the way we phrase it, uh, is um, well, basically we say you when you acknowledge the event, right? If you use Kafka, you commit the offset, right? Uh, at the point where you commit the offset, it means you've taken care of it. So if you never commit the offset, this is how you express, okay? Um, I can't handle it. I really can't understand it. Now, if you really want to, so I think we learned about this a bit earlier as well. There are different approaches, of course, to this depending on your use cases. What I call the one is I call it the end in court approach. You know, in the Toyota system, when there was a, a kaput piece on the on the conveyor belt, they pulled the end in court and everything stopped. Um, th maybe your system can do this, and you say, okay, something is really messed up here. I get sort of illegal events. I'm just going to stop processing, and it's basically going to basically probably going to loop on this event. Right? And say I try to process this event, pass exception, not committing the offset, go back. This will kind of halt your system, and then you need to intervene. You can do this. Or you can stash it and say, okay, I'm going to skip this one. If you can't really pass it, okay, that's really dodgy, right? You don't know if it's, well, it's probably not referring to any entity. So, yeah, you need to handle this. But it's an exceptional case. That would need some intervention, yeah. Yeah? Um, I wonder, because when you, so if you start, if you start having some, some things, some plates, which depends on, uh, on events, so I interpret some events. You have, a, you have an entity in this mm -hmm. service which interprets events coming from anywhere. It is not a way to introduce some coupling, some indirect coupling in the yeah. fact that now, of course, the emitter of the event is not directly or at runtime dependent on the event. Or th there is no direct dependency at runtime, but there is an indirect dependency. Absolutely. If I, if I change, I can't, I, I can't change in events, it's a structure of the semantic of an event from one of the emitter without taking into account the fact that this would be received somewhere else. And if you have services that consume multiple events from multiple other services, then now you have kind of com a contention point at some point. So how do you handle that? See what I mean? Or I, uh, so I'm going to ask you about this again about the second part. For the first part, I can say yes. Uh, there's always uh, there's always going to be coupling, uh, and there's, I, I saw a great talk once about different layers of coupling and, and software systems and so on. So, there, um, of course, we, we, we are coupled. We need to understand the event, um, and, uh, and it's not, yeah. What we remove is really just the, sort of the technical, the temporal coupling, right? Because I just subscribe to events and I just emit yeah, events at what time, yes, yeah, semantic coupling still exists. Um, uh, there might be, uh, this would be a different talk in a different area, how to sort of also, but that's not my ambition, right? I don't want to sort sure. of build systems where I can say, oh, I can replace any service with any other service. And, the, yeah. um, and the second was about contention. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, the only, uh, if you have a, a workflow, whatever that means, in the in your system, which reacts or which depends or which interprets events coming from several, and it's in a way that I think another processor workflow would need to interpret different kind of events to, to deal with the fact that it received events or it, the other status that you showed at the last slide. Yeah. This one depends on three different services. Ah, yeah. And in a way, this means that all the three services depend on this one. Oh, way. yeah, but not the flow, right? So this is like a total, like a pure downstream service. It only... Um, it's like, let's say you have some order state machine, your order goes through different states, you, and you want this kind of uh, unified view, right? You want to say the order is in the, in the state of uh, whatever started, or uh, payment is being handled, and so on. <coughs> right? And you don't want to look into the, 
into these uh, individual services. So, but you don't also don't want to lose the capability to have this unified view, right? So you want to create a level of, of observability, but it's really just consuming. At, at no point would any any other service wait on this. No, no of course yeah. not. Uh, so I, it wouldn't create contention in that sense. No, yeah. it doesn't create contention at that. Oh, like a, it's, it's a semi, 